Orange. Live from West Orange. Live from West Orange. It's Monday lunch. All right. So when last we meet, we had a couple of days off. Today is uh, January 7th, the first of Shabbat on the sacred calendar. And we had just done a piece on 24B, uh, and we should probably go back and review the Mishnah. And I can do a really quick read-through, what we call Chazara, B'Kiyut, a quick review of what the Talmud was that we did uh, in the week or so before we broke, and then we'll be able to move forward, okay? So as you are gathering with your lunch and your drinks, we are on 24B of Masechet Sanhedrin, Chapter 3, Zeborer, and the question raised by the Mishnah is not really a question, it's a series of statements about who is not kosher, who is pasul. Pasul means unfit or forbidden. Um, a Torah scroll that has mistakes in it, God forbid, is pasul, cannot be used. Tzitzit, that, whose knots have become unraveled, uh, is pa- they are pasul, they cannot be used. Um, mostly things that are pasul can usually be fixed and made kosher meaning fit for use. Kosher can apply to things that are not food as well as food. Kosher just means something is fit for use under Jewish law by a Jewish person. Uh, okay, so Eluhen Pasulim, these are the ones who are ineligible to be judges and witnesses in a court of law. They are presumed to be untrustworthy, unbelievable, unreliable. First category is Misachek B'Kubiyah, a dice player. Malve B'Ribit, a lender on interest, usurious interest would be the classical English word for that. Mafriche uh, yonim, pigeon flyers. Sochre shvi'i, people who sell sabbatical year produce. Amar Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon comes in immediately to qualify that concept of sabbatical year sellers. And he says, you may remember that, but techila hayu korinotan osfei shvi'i, well, back when I was young, long ago, we used to call them sabbatical produce gatherers. We changed it to sellers. Why? When those who were oppressors increased in the land, we changed the prohibition to the sellers of sabbatical produce. And we talked about that <coughs> quickly. There's a historical reality here that the Roman tax collectors didn't care that it was your sabbatical year. They saw the crops growing, they saw you eating them, and they said, you still owe taxes. So people had to gather um, uh, economically large amounts of produce beyond what they needed for their personal needs, which would normally be forbidden by the Torah as sabbatical year produce. You're allowed to harvest what you need for yourself. You're not allowed to harvest for business and to sell. Um, but you needed to harvest that amount in order to pay the Romans. So it's not the people gathering that produce who are now forbidden from a court of law because they're on noose, they're forced, it's not their fault. If someone's got a gun to your head, you have to do it. You shouldn't have to pay the price. Um, rather, it's the ones who then, after they pay those taxes, sell some of that produce in the market. Now they're obviously breaking the sabbatical year law. So those people are forbidden. So that's the little comment that comes in here, says it's a historical development in that law because of Roman oppression. Amar Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda comes in, and he's not talking about the sabbatical year people. He's going all the way back to the dice player. And he says, Ematai, when is this true that the dice player is possible? He is not acceptable as a witness or a judge. He says, Bizman she'en lahem omanut elahu, <laughs> and I'm going to be coughing throughout the lesson, so I apologize for that in advance. He says that he is pasul, he is not believed for testimony or as a judge, in a time that he has no other trade, whatever it may be. Omanut elahu. Aval, yesh len, omanut shalohu, kesherin. But if he has some kind of job to, to live from, he's kosher. So if you've got a job and you play dice, you're kosher. If you don't have a job and you play dice, you're not kosher. Rab, uh, and uh, Rabbi Yehuda does not give an explanation why he distinguishes these two, uh, but the Gemara goes into it at some length and the Tosafot go into it at length. 
<coughs> okay, so the Gemara immediately goes back to the dice player, says, Mesachek Bekubia, my Kaved, what's a dice player doing that's so bad? And Rami Barchama says, Mishum Dehav Asmachta, Vasmachta Lokanya. He says, because the dice uh, gambling is an illegal form of, um, uh, uh, of trade that it's an asmachta, there's a contingency in the deal that you don't know the outcome of the contingency, so you don't know if there's really a deal, and you can't commit to a financial deal based on an unknown contingency. That's actually not a kosher way to set up anything, no matter what it is, no matter what the contingency is. You could say based on it being 50 degrees tomorrow, you could say based on whether or not a girl with a, a red shirt walks down the street, or whether or not the dice fall on 7 or 11. Those are all contingencies that you, you don't know what they are, so you can't have a kosher deal. Uh, he says, Rami Barhama says, that that form of business trade is not legal. It's not an effective form of making a deal. Therefore, when you take the money, you're a thief. Because <coughs> you didn't make a deal. So you don't have permission to take the money. Okay, so that's his point of view. That it's just about asmachta. Uh, Rav Shesha comes, be- and comes in and says, no, it has nothing to do with asmachta. It's because they're not functioning, and we use the classical English word, the social wheel, W-E-A-L, the well-being of society, the economic participation of upstanding citizens, right, building a community. That concept, it, it, because they're parasites, Right? Because they're, they're, they're ne'er-do-wells. They're, they contribute nothing. They're not reliable. They're not invested in the good of society, so they wouldn't care if they lied to get whatever it is they want. That kind of concept. Sounds a lot like Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda in the Mishnah, and the Gemara makes that analogy immediately. So, so my binaihu, what's the difference between Rami Barham and Rav Sheshit? Ika binaihu, the Gemara Minuta, when there's achrita, when there's some other form of employment. So Rami bar says, doesn't matter if he's employed or not, he's not kosher for witnessing or being a judge. And Sheshit said if he's employed, if he's in Yishu Vosholam, then he's kosher. Right? Immediately that created a problem, which we charted last time, that Rami bar seems to be in conflict with Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda in the Mishnah. Uh, Rami bar is an Amora, he's post-Mishnah. <coughs> Excuse me. Rabbi Yehuda is Mishnah age, he has more authority, so Rabbi Barhama can't really contradict Rabbi Yehuda. You have to solve how he can possibly be contradicting Rabbi Yehuda. So, Utnan, and we learned in our Mishnah, Amar Rabbi Yehuda, a matai, when did, when we know from the Mishnah, Rabbi Yehuda says, when is he not allowed? Bisman she'en lehen omanut elohu, when he doesn't have another trade, aval yesh lehen omanut shalohu, har is a kesherim, he's kosher if he has another job, and it sure sounds like the reasoning of the Mishnah is the same as Rav Sheshit, that it's Yishu Vosha Olam. Yep? Would this apply to a baked in today? Yes. So you couldn't have a gambler as a member of the baked in? Not a professional gambler. If the, if the, the guy in the baked in has a job, let's say he's a Rosh Yeshiva. Yeah. So he has a job. And he plays dice with his friends on the weekend. Sunday, of course, yeah. right? Then it's okay. You get a picture of him playing in the casinos in Atlantic City, it's okay. You get a picture of him playing in the casinos in Atlantic City every day, he's not okay. What about the casino owner who doesn't gamble himself? That, it, it's interesting whether the casino owner is himself depending upon, like, is he a gambler or is he a business owner? Right, right. It's an interesting question. Right? All right. So uh, this would be a difficulty. This point that Yehuda and Yeshiva Sholom sound like the same thing is Akashia. It's a difficulty against Rabbi Barhama, who said it's only about Asmachta. It's only about contingency. It's not about whether he has a job. So they're in conflict. So the first answer to that is Vichy Tema. You could say, Pliga Rabbanan Ale de Rabbi Yehuda. You could say, we have a principle that Rabbi Yehuda and the rabbis are in conflict with each other, and Rabbi Yehuda in the Mishnah is in conflict with the rabbis, and therefore Rabbi Yehuda in the Mishnah doesn't need to be listened to because he's overruled by the rabbis. In which case, Rabbi Barhamah can argue with him. Now, is that in the Mishnah? No. So they, if they're going to make that up, it's because they're not making it up. 
they're going to raise it because they've got another source where that happens. Okay? So that you're getting to know the Stam of the Gemara pretty well. When he brings up something weird, in a few paragraphs, all of a sudden it's going to be, oh, there it is. He brings some source that exactly says the weird thing. So he's anticipating the source. Yeah. What if you're a professional gambler, but you give 10% of your <coughs> winnings to charity? The charity is not supposed to take the money. If you're a professional thief, right, it's, it, it's a mitzvah, a baba, a vera. It, the money itself is what you stole, and you give that money to the hospital for children with cancer, you might make the argument, pikoach nefesh, I'm saving a life. But if you give that money to the rabbi's discretionary fund for scholarships or something, rabbi can't take the money, for sure can't take the money. It's tainted money. It's theft, right? That's why all these political campaigns have to keep returning donations. <coughs> right. I mean, when, every once in a while, a name will come down off of a university building because of something that has occurred. The name is no longer kosher. And do they just take the name down, or do they give the money back? Usually, they just take the name down, right? Because the money's gone. The most recent. And remove the statue. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so you might say that the rabbis are arguing with Rabbi Yehuda. That's one thing you might say. Trust me that you might say that because they have a source for it. Hello. Pass one of these down, please, Stuart. Uh, okay. The Hamar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. Because Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. <coughs> I did medicate myself before this class. I apologize. Okay. It won't help. It's in my lungs. Rabbi Yo- 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 thank you, though. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who is also in Amora, says that Kol Makom Shemar Rabbi Yehuda, every place where Rabbi Yehuda says Ematai or Uvame, these kinds of what are the circumstance questions, Ematai when and Uvame with what, Eno Ela Lefaresh Divrei Chachamim. It is only to explain the words of the rabbis, not to contradict them. So we have a principle from another Amora that when we read Mishnah and we see Rabbi Yehuda and he asks Ematai, it means he's, he's not arguing with the rabbis. So you could have saved Rabbi bar by saying he was arguing with the rabbis and the rabbis won, but we have this principle from this other guy who says because he used Ematai, we know he's not arguing with the rabbis. We're going to drop another little aside in here from the source, which says, um, by the way, Rabbi Yochanan Amar, Ematai, Lefaresh, Uvame Lachalok. Um, it, there's this other thing that says, well, when he says Ematai, it's to explain the rabbis, but if he says Ubame, that means he's arguing with the rabbis. But in this case, he said Ematai, Duchule Alma, Ematai Lefareshu. And everyone agrees that Ematai means he's agreeing with the rabbis. So you can't save Rabbi Barhama that way. Okay? The Gemara is going to reject that rejection. It's going to do it like this. Gavra Gavra Karamit. It's an Amora who says this about Rabbi Yehuda. And it's an Amora, Rami Barhama, who's disagreeing with Rabbi Yehuda. But the only reason he's in trouble <coughs> is because Rabbi Yehuda seems to not be arguing with the rabbis. The only reason we don't think he's arguing with the rabbis is because of another Amora. Rami Barhama gets to argue with another Amora. He could say, I don't believe you about Ematai. I don't accept the principle that Ematai means he's not arguing with rabbis. I think he could say Ematai and still be arguing with rabbis. Rami Barhama could say that. So it's Gavra Agavra, right? It's just two Amoras who have a difference of opinion about that principle, so Rami Barhama can still argue Asmachta. This is review, but am I making your head spin, so are you okay? <laughs> kind of, sort of not? The All right. So it, Rami Barhama is in trouble if Rabbi Yehuda is winning because he can't argue with a Tana. There's an Amora <coughs> whose principle about Ematai proves that Rabbi Yehuda is still winning and is not arguing with the rabbis. But that's an Amora saying that. So Rabbi Barhama doesn't have to care. He could still say to that Amora, you're wrong. The rabbis are overruling Rabbi Yehuda. He could still be saying that. But this is the Gemara 200 years later when in the editorial process setting all this up. So we don't know what Rabbi Barkama actually said. <coughs> okay, so Gavra Agavra, it could just be 
to Amorim, slugging it out. Masavar plige or Masavar la plige. One thought they argued and one thought they didn't argue and because of this Amatai. We don't need to follow it. They, Rabbi, now these two, they're at different times. They're not one-on-one. -on -one those two Amoras are at the same time, but they're not actually in conversation with each other. The Gemara is taking those two things and putting them next to each other as if they were talking to each mm -hmm. other. The editor of the Gemara later on is doing that. He's crafting this section of the Talmud out of these sources and creating ideas. All right. The Moraim that he's talking about are in the late 200s of the Common Era. Okay. 250, 280. And the editor of this is more like 500 That's of the Common Era, like two, two and a half centuries later okay. with a lot of stuff piled in, and he's, he's setting all this out. Typically, right after a Mishnah, you have your earliest Amoraim put in there by the editor of the Gemara. So you have a Mishnah, and then you have your early Amoraim, and then it goes later, 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 and when he runs out of stuff, he starts a new Mishnah. So usually it's chronological, not always. In this case, it is. Okay. Now, so you could say it's an Amora against an Amora. And one says there are, that Rabbi Yehuda is arguing with the Chachamim, and one is, says Rabbi Yehuda is not arguing with the Chachamim, and that's the argument the Amoraim are having about the Tanaim. You could say that. Now the Gemara rejects that rejection of the rejection. Vila plige. But really, they didn't disagree. <coughs> now he's going to try and bring in a source that shows that Rabbi Yehuda and the Chachamim actually do fight, which would save Rami bar -Hama. Because Rabbi Yehuda wouldn't be important anymore, and he could ignore what he has to say. The Tanya. Remember, Tanya, Tana, means a Mishnah age source. Ha is an objection. The Ha Tanya. But, in fact, it teaches. Uh, so we're going to bring an objection from a Baraita. Bain Sheyesh Lo Omanut Shalo, who Bain Sheyesh Lo Omanut Ella, who Hare Zepasul. There's actually a Baraita about this same Mishnah, another version of the Mishnah that Rabbi Yehuda Nasi did not include in the Mishnah, that follows up Rabbi Yehuda with, and it doesn't matter if he has a trade, both are Pasul. So the whole reason we had this argument running behind us is not because Rami Barham is in trouble, but because Rami bar -Hama seems to agree with a Baraita that contradicts the Mishnah, that's what's really going on. This Baraita has another line that the Mishnah doesn't have. And it in fact says that Rabbi Yehuda is wrong. And the principle of having a job is irrelevant. A gambler is not kosher. I don't remember that part. <coughs> it was not in the Mishnah. It's in the Baraita which is a, a Mishnah age teaching that Rabbi Yudanasi did not include in the Mishnah. Now, why did Rabbi Yudanasi leave that line out? Because he disagrees with it. Because he doesn't want that to be the halacha. Because he agrees with Rabbi Yehuda. So we have a case here, not of just an alternate form of a Mishnah, but of an actual line that obviously seems to fit it would be very smooth. It would make the mission to make a lot more sense. <coughs> because the question is, Elu Hena Pasulin, who is Pasul? The question is not, who is kosher? The question the Mishnah leads with is, who is Pasul? Rabbi Yehuda finishes it off by telling us who's kosher. Which is not an answer to the Mishnah's question. The Baraita ends with an answer about who is not kosher, which is an answer to the Mishnah. The Baraita is probably the original form. It is the Mishnah's question, and it ties it all up in a bow. So we're victims of revisionist history based on the, what the editor wants. There is no such thing as revisionist history. <laughs> there is only history. <laughs> no Written by no the <laughs> Our understanding of history changes depending upon who then is the author of the history nowadays. Okay. So, so the question, the, the real question is what's the difference between Talmud and Mishnah? Mishnah was an attempt 
to take all the different teachings and scrunch them all down into a single coherent book which would clearly teach the halakha. That is not the purpose of the Talmud. The purpose of the Talmud is to break it back open again and engage in scholastic activity to understand the principles underlying the arguments that sometimes fell silent through the process of the Mishnah and to give them life and voice again so that as we enter new history and new times and new places, those principles, those manners of argumentation, what's important when you make a decision, what's in, what's out, the contextuality of it all comes back alive again. So in a new context, you can come up with what the halakha should be, and it's not new halakha, because it's following the ancient principles and processes. If you wind up with something different than the Mishnah, you could say it's new halakha, unless it reflects a process that the Mishnah had edited out. When the Shulchan Aruch came in, in a way, it closed Torah about that. Right. By, by saying, you can't change The better it. example is Maimonides. Why does Maimonides call his code of halakha the Mishnah Torah? It's a pun. Mishnah there means teaching. It also means second. It's the second Torah. It's a second teaching. It's a teaching of teaching, because Torah means teaching. So there's a lot, a lot of puns in there. And what does he do? He brings it all right back down to halakha again. It's like writing a second Mishnah, right? The Shulchan Aruch at least has explanations. <coughs> and it's a Sephardi document with an Ashkenazi commentary. So it's the Ramah, Rabbi Moshe Israel, is his commentary on the Shulchan Aruch that becomes the halakha for Ashkenaz. So it has within it a dynamic system of Sephardi and Ashkenaz interaction. So it's not didactic. It's not meant to simplify. It's meant to explain, but still engage some level of differences in understanding. The Mishnah Torah, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon's, Maimonides' version, is not meant to do that. It's, here's the halakha, which is what Rabbi Yudha Nasi tried to do. Now, he shows different points of view. You have Hillel and Shammai and stuff, but there's still pretty much a clear winner in every Mishnah. In this case, he cut the other point of view out and left it on the cutting room floor, very clearly. And the Gemara knows it. And the Gemara is bringing it back. Now, that doesn't make it the halakha, because it's the bright and not the Mishnah. So the Mishnah gets the halakha. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi is going to win on this. But the Gemara is going to call him out on it, so that he doesn't completely get away with it. So this sounds like a halakha version of the world according to God. <laughs> Uh, it's been a long time since I saw the world. <coughs> the, the, the Talmud is the Talmud, and if you're saying the Mishnah is through the lens of the person who's interpreting. The, the Mishnah is definitely through the lens of Rabbi Yudha Nasi as a member of the school of Hillel, as a legacy of Rabbi Akiva. Mm -hmm. It is clearly a, a parochial uh, and... and, and it's a document that, that lines up on one side of the theological, religious, philosophical, political battles of the first two centuries of the Common Era. Clearly, when you study the remainder of the material that's out there, that the Mishnah lines up on that side. Okay, So there's a lot of other stuff that got left or changed or th versions were chosen or whatever. And the joy of Talmud is bringing in all these bright tote to show the alternative, not facts, but the alternative teachings and alternative interpretations, and then to say, how could these rabbis have different opinions when they're all drinking from the same fountain from Sinai? Surely there's only one ultimate truth. And what's, what, what's shown is that they have these kinds of principles. I thought an asmachta was not kosher, but an asmachta is kosher. Well, I thought an asmachta was not kosher, but only in that circumstance. And I would say he would have agreed with me had we talked about it, about the circumstance, but you didn't get a version of him talking about that circumstance. You just heard the first version, and therefore you think he never accepts asmachta. Like that kind of massaging of potential to bring everything back together is the lure of Talmud. There's an elusive synthesis of all the contradictions that is out there like a siren's call in Talmud study, pulling us farther and farther into the logic between these different points of view to try and find, are there actually convergences or is it just differences? 
Right? And that's the play that Talmud gives us. Okay, let's move on because this is still supposed to be Chazar. This is still review. All right, so this is still review. So lo, plige, this is 25A. We're near the, the top of 25A. In the Schottenstein that you have is 25A1, left column, middle paragraph. The Gemara challenges Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi and Rabbi Yochanan's understanding of this word ematai, the lo plige, did they really not uh, disagree? The hatanya, we have this baraita, whether or not they have a trade, they're not eligible. <coughs> so you have to answer that. Because we know that Rabbi Yehud in fact does win, and we know that the rabbis are not in the Mishnah arguing with him, therefore Rabbi bar has to be wrong. That's kind of the drive of this whole thing, and so the Gemara is going to have to save the Mishnah from the Baraita. Hahi Rabbi Yehuda Mishum Rabbi Taifonhu. That Rabbi Yehuda that you just quoted that have the rabbis saying that was when he was quoting Rabbi Tarfun about another topic. Okay? And here's the topic. All right? The topic is Rabbi Yehuda Omer Mishum Rabbi Tarfun. Le'olam ein echad mehem nazir. Lefi shelo natna nazirut elo lehafla'a. In an argument about a guy who is a Nazir, a Nazarite, he swore an oath not to have intimacy, not to become impure, not to cut his hair, not to drink wine for some period of time, and then he has to shave himself down, cleanse, give a sacrifice, and thank God for the blessings that have been giving him because of his asceticism. It's a whole system in the Torah. It's actually in the Torah. Rabbi Tarfon there is quoted by Rabbi Yehuda as um, prohibiting something. Right? Prohibiting someone who's doing something. And it's because, the reason he's strict there is because the prohibition is actually spelled out in the Torah. That's what hafla'a means. It's, it's been made absolutely clear. It's a Torah command we're dealing with. Is a dice player in the Torah? No. Are non-kosher witnesses in the Torah? No. The Torah says on the basis of two people, a thing is established. It doesn't say unless they're shepherds, unless they're dice players. So the argument here is that when Rabbi Yehuda has that argument with Chachamim and he gets restrictive and you're trying to make that, that Rabbi Yehuda of the Baraita, that was actually Rabbi Yehuda quoting Rabbi Tarfon about things that are spelled out in the Torah. Here he is neither quoting Rabbi Tarfon nor is it something spelled out in the Torah. So Rabbi Yehuda might actually take a different point of view and support the rabbis, not be in conflict with the rabbis here, which means he can get the halakha, he wins in the Mishnah. The Baraita is a different case, it's not in conflict, it's a different case, and therefore Rami Barhama is still in trouble. Rabbi, so is this his attempt to try to extrapolate the idea for what would have been modern times then, to have current applications for whatever we Yes, I think actually in the time, it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a very subtle point you're making, historically, and I think it's correct. At the time of the editing of this tractate, there are no Nazirs, right? There is no Nazi root. But I, I'd be willing to give you odds that there's dice players, <laughs> right? So you do have a historical reality in his age that you could say Rabbi Yehuda was strict about these Nazirim and had there were Nazirs cannot be kosher and, and he can he could just leave that out there because no one's going to come up and say, oh yeah, my uncle Joe's a Nazir and so and so in the court let him testify. Right? No one's going to bring a Nazir to contradict you. You don't have the realia. Right? You don't have the world experience and so he, he can bring it, he can put it into a category that's completely irrelevant in his age allowing him to permit the category under Rabbi Yehuda's terms for the dice player, which is still an ongoing issue in the time of the Talmud. Right? That's a very good point. Right? So he saves the situation by putting it into an archaic category and dismissing and maintaining the text in front of him, which is something everybody knows. I like that. Okay. So, that's that. And we're done. So from the beginning, where Rami bar came in and said it's asmachda, and Rav Sheshit said it's not asmachda, it's yeshuvo shalolam, and omanut are now the same thing. So Rav Sheshit said it's participation in the social order. Rav Yehuda's language in the Mishnah is he has to have a job. And we have come to equate those as the same thing. Participation in the social order means having a job. Okay? And we decided last time that it has to be a job, it can't be stuff you're doing volunteer. Well, you raised the concept of like super volunteers who affect the social order through their philanthropy, not a known category. Okay. 
for the Talmud, right? I think we're, I think we are sensitive to that category as being a productive member of society, not a known category for the Talmud. Okay, you had a Parnas, but you didn't have philanthropy, not the same thing. Well, I also think there's no philanthropy in terms of money, but I mean, people who do volunteers more than that. Right. <coughs> I, I think that the people who were the philanthropic forces in the society, like we have, we have donor plaques and mosaics from the third century and these kinds of things, I think those people still had businesses and occupations and trades. Uh, you know, the concept that you have a family foundation that allows you to transform the world through your philanthropic activity, I mean, that's just a whole, capitalism hasn't developed to that level in the Talmudic time. No, not yet. Doesn't allow people to have that kind of role in society. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, now, we're going to move on. Uh, we did move on already. We did this. So, the Malve Beribi. So, the, the Mishnah, there's two words. They're very close to each other. You need to distinguish them. Malve is the person who causes the loan. That's the banker. Milve. Uh, milva is the loan itself. Malve is the loaner. I'll write them down. I'll write them down in transliteration. For okay? Malve is the banker or the loaner. Okay? The milva is the loan. And the love is the borrower. Well, you could tell the difference between the, the malve and the love. Yeah, but the malve, the malve, malve and milve, you can't tell the difference. It's the exact same letters. So from context, you just know. Okay? Thankfully, it doesn't use the word milva too much, but unfortunately, it does a little bit. Okay, so here we go. So the malve beribi, the person who loans with interest, is breaking Torah law. You're simply not allowed to charge your countrymen interest in the Torah. Okay? It says specifically countrymen, so you can learn from that that non-countrymen you can. Now, let's make a point. Despite where this went in medieval society and feudal society and the subjugation of Jews only into capitalist systems and then the despoiling of Jews because of their participation in capitalist systems and the evil and anti-Semitism involved in that, Say it again. Give, <laughs> that's why I made a recording, so you can play it back. Uh, uh, but I said it correctly, and I meant what I said. There, there's rife anti-Semitism in Western civilization in the capitalist system against Jews participating in most industries, putting them into this particular capitalist industry, and then blaming them for being evil money-grabbing Jews because they're in the industry that is the only industry that the non-Jews would let us be in. This is a well-known historical fact. I don't need to argue it. Um, Put all that aside. The truth of the matter is that the Torah says there's a bunch of laws that apply between you and your, your fellow, and the implication is they do not apply between you and your non-fellow. And some of them are modern embarrassments to them, to us. For example, slavery laws. We like to say there's no such thing as perpetual chattel slavery in the Bible. It's a form of servitude, indentured servitude, and workers who sell their own labor, etc. The non-Jewish slave can be born a slave and remain a slave their whole life, whereas the Jewish slave cannot in biblical law. So that's a modern embarrassment to us, right, hopefully. So you, those things exist. In, in capital cases, things might have been different as well. And in that case, it's mostly because the non-Jewish authorities and the non-Jewish population are not going to subject themselves to Jewish law. So, so you can't really make laws about their behavior, which means you can't make laws about your behavior with them because you would be binding them to your law in that sense. So most Jewish law in the Torah does really not apply to interactions with non-Jews because they're not in the system and you can't enforce it. So it's really an internally pointed document. It's not meant to be the way humanity should be. It's meant to be the way the people of the covenant behave among themselves. The Torah is largely an inwardly pointed document. Right? It's us for us. So a lot of the laws don't apply. You can, you can do non-kosher shechting 
you can you can own a McDonald's. You're not supposed to serve Jews, but there's nothing wrong with that, right? So you're not prohibited from creating trace meat. You're just prohibited from eating it. You can even benefit from it. Right. Yeah. Right. So so all the laws of the Torah kind of apply that way. It's not the same for us and them. That doesn't mean that there's any chicanery going on, but anti-Semites like to say there always is. Right? So you just take it on a case by case. You look at it. Okay, here we go. So the Malve Berit, the he lends on interest. Amar Rava, Love Berit Pasul Le'edut. So I love this. So you've got the 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 banker. You've got a borrower, and you've got a friend. Okay? Rob is going to come in and he's going to say, this guy's not kosher. But the question is, how do you prove he's not kosher? How do you prove he's not a kosher witness? You have to bring witnesses that he loaned at interest. Right? You have to establish him. So. The case they're about to bring is that the borrower is one of the people testifying that this guy, poo poo poo, shame on him, engaged in usurious interest. So he and his friend were present when the loan was enacted. He and his friend go to the court and say, I saw this guy lending at interest. Get the case? All right. So let's see what happens. So, Amar Rava. This guy is not allowed to be a witness because he borrowed at interest. Right? The borrower is forbidden, according to Rava. Okay? The Ha'an and Tanan, but Ha, objection coming. On a Tanan, it is taught in our Mishnah, Malve Beribit. The banker is the one who is forbidden. Now it's going to say milva hababa ribit, a loan that comes with interest, is what the Mishnah really means. So everybody participating in the loan would be pasul, would be not kosher as a witness, because it's the milva, not the malve. So what's happening? They're talking about the dots and the vowels. They're saying you're reading the Mishnah wrong. It's not malva beribit, it's milva beribit. Okay, so it's the milva, it's the loan that makes people not kosher for witnesses. Now, uh, and we're going to bring a case, and here's the case. It's Bar ben- Benitos. So, Mr. Benitos, not a very good Jewish name, Asahidu Be Tre Sahade, had two witnesses coming in against him. So, you have this guy, uh, Bar Benitos, has two witnesses come against him, and here's what the witnesses say. One says, he lent money in my presence. So this is the friend. I saw him do it. Neener, neener, neener. Right? And the next guy comes in. And I saw him lend me money at interest. So I saw him lend money at interest. I saw him lend me money at interest. Do we have two kosher witnesses? Maybe. That's the question. If we have two kosher water. witnesses, he's going to be made not kosher. But, but if he's not a kosher witness, then he's still kosher. But the reason he's not a kosher witness is, is because he lent him money at interest. So how can he still be kosher? Right. Da, 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 da. Did anybody watch the Chicago game yesterday? There was a play in the playoffs yesterday between uh, Chicago and uh, New England, uh, Philadelphia. There was a guy went to catch the ball. And as he's catching the ball, he takes three steps running, which by definition in the NFL is a catch. <coughs> so he has acquired the ball at that point. However, he was taking the three steps. The defender had his hand in there and was ripping it at him. And the ball came out, and the ball went bouncing down the field another 15 yards. The referee blew the whistle <coughs> and declared it an incomplete catch. The referee and everyone stopped and they went to the, back to their huddles and then there was a challenge flag 
and they said, we want to review, and there was a TV review, and they went back, and they, in the TV review, they saw the three steps, and they declared it to be a legal catch and a fumble, making it a live ball. And they started looking around. Where's the ball? Because the ref had blown the whistle and said it was not a catch, nobody bothered to go pick up the ball, which was 15 yards down the field, abandoned. And another umpire down there had picked up the ball. Right? So you have a catch 22. And so by rule, since it was a fumble with no recovery, the original catch is not a catch. And the team loses the play, and they have to go back to where they started from. Now, the only reason that happened was because there was a review that declared it, in fact, was a catch. Once it was a catch, it can be a fumble. And once it's a fumble, it can be a recovery. But there was no recovery. And because there was no recovery, it now gets ruled not a catch. So then it's an incomplete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the rules committee is going to have a fit over this in the off season and they're going to come up with some revision of this because it took them like 10 minutes to figure it out and they still had no good explanation the only thing that establishes that this guy is loaning it interest is this guy saying as the second witnesses that he did it to him but he's not a kosher witness to say it And you need two witnesses to establish something. So we have a catch-22. He wouldn't be kosher if the guy he did it with were kosher. But the guy he did it with is not kosher because he did it with him, which makes the guy pasul. But the guy's pasul, so he can't show that he's pasul. So the guy who he did it with is, in fact, kosher. So this guy's pasul without proof, and this guy is left kosher because the proof is wanting. So the banker's actually lying because he could be a witness against himself. <laughs> he could. He could. Right? But we're going to see. Let's see what happens. So they're going to deal with this a little bit. <coughs> so this, is, this guy's got a name. His name is Benitus. This is Bar Benitus. Bar Benitus. Okay? So, Bar Benitus. He uh, he, so, uh, two witnesses. One says, I saw him do it. The other says, I saw him do it to me. And Rava disqualified, posle Rava la Barbenitos. On the basis of this, Rava said that this guy, the loner, is not kosher. So, the loner is not kosher. Um, but, vaha, Rava hu damar, lo veberibi pasule edut. But the Gemara says, how can Rava have said that this guy's not kosher if Rava's principle is that it's the love, the borrower, who's the one who's not kosher. So Rava seems to be saying that the guy who loans at interest isn't doing anything wrong. It's the guy who borrows at interest is the one who's wrong. What, does that make sense? No. Well, it must because Rava's not dumb. So <laughs> what could Rava possibly be thinking to say that it is the borrower who is in fact committing the sin against the Torah? Uh, maybe, but I, I think Rob is looking at what the two men have done. What has each of them actually done, and who's wrong? The Torah says you're not allowed to lend at interest, borrow at interest, something like that. At what point does that become a sin? When the money goes to the borrower, or when the interest comes back to the loaner? There's nothing wrong with me giving you a million dollars. There's something wrong with me charging a penny interest. Giving you the million dollars is not a sin, no matter what we said to each other. Once you pay me back at interest, that's the sin. Get it? So Rava says it's the borrower who commits the sin when he pays the interest. But if that's the condition for getting the money, then why is that? But it's an illegal condition. I'm still allowed to give you money. If I give you $500 and I say, um, I don't know, I, I expect you to flap your arms and fly around the room three times. Or, no, I got a better one. I expect you to eat trafe. Here's $500, eat trafe. And then give it back to me. There's nothing wrong with giving you $500. I'm not allowed to tell you to eat trafe, so that condition, in fact, never existed. 
can you keep the $500? Sure. Can you give it back to me? Sure. Do you have to eat trafe? No. no. I cannot bind you to eat trafe. So if the loner binds you to do something forbidden by the Torah, you can ignore that. That binding is ineffective because it's forbidden by the Torah. So, so you're the one breaking Torah when you voluntarily pay interest that's forbidden. So the borrower is a legitimate witness until he pays the interest. Yes. That, that would seem to be correct to me. All right? Why is the borrower testifying against Barbenitos? He doesn't want to pay the interest. And his friend's in it with him. Right? And, and, and is Bar Benitos going to testify that he loaned on interest? Not if he wants to keep his no. good name. Of course he's going to testify that he loaned on interest. If he doesn't, he'll never get the interest. Ah, that's true. Right? So he's going to tell the truth. So this guy wants to make him not a kosher witness. The, the, the subtlety in the middle here really doesn't make sense. The whole, I mean, it's a pox on both their houses, which is why the solution milva, it's a loan at interest is forbidden, is a great one because it makes everybody not kosher if they engage in the activity. All right, let's see what happens to Barbie Nutos and Rabbi. Is it any kind of interest or is it usurious interest that we're talking about? Percent increase on the, on the principle of the loan. I don't know a difference between interest and usurious interest. Are you it's saying usurious? Usurious means a lot. No, so. It's 50, 40%. Oh, okay. So, so in English, we're using usurious to mean exaggerated yes. and unfair. Yes. I don't think that's what the word means. Okay. Well, that's a modern. I think. I, modern it's any interest is forbidden in the biblical system. That's what I'm okay. about. Is it any or? So how can you make Rava the guy who says that this guy can be believed about this guy loaning and this guy is therefore not a kosher witness because he loaned an interest when Rava is the one who said that it's this guy who's not kosher, right? All right, so what's the answer to that? I'm going the wrong way. Vahavale um, Russia. So the second guy, when he says he borrowed at interest to make this guy not a kosher judge or testimony, this guy is making himself a rasha. I broke the following halacha, therefore that guy should be punished. He's admitting he's a rasha, he's a bad person, he's breaking halacha. V'ha Torah amra, and Torah says, al teshet rasha aid. Do not place an evildoer as a witness. So you can't have a rasha as a witness according to the Torah. The Gemara answers, Rav Latamai, Rav follows his own reasoning, Dama Rav, Adam Karov etzel etzmo, ve'en adam misim etzmo rasha. Rav has a principle that nothing a person can do or say in court can be established to make him a rasha. Doesn't mean he's not a rasha, but you can't use his own words to make him a rasha. You can't use your words. Anything you, can, anything you say can and will be used against you, not to make you a rasha. Not according to Rava. So since this guy can't make himself a Russia by saying he paid back a loan at interest, he's believed about this guy. And this guy is now proven to have engaged in a milva that's forbidden, and he's thrown out according to Rava. Now, if there were two witnesses who came and said this guy was the love, he would not be a kosher witness. Rava would have him thrown out. It's only because the only reason we know it about him is because he's saying it about himself, and Rava doesn't let a person do that about himself. Therefore, he's believed by Rava to throw this guy out. You think this guy's going to find two witnesses next time he loans to someone? Right? This guy needs two witnesses against this guy to stop this all from happening. Okay, the problem is those two witnesses would also be saying that he did it, so they'd all get thrown out. Okay, here we go. So Rav Latamai, and he says a Dan Karov, and now we're going to get another case of a person who's a bad person. And the question is, once a person is a bad person, can they ever be forgiven? Can they ever be allowed back? So I lent at interest once, and it was proven in court. Can I ever sign a ketubah ever again? What do I have to do? Okay. So that's the next question. 
And it's a case that we had here in Muncie just a few years ago. Um, there was a certain butcher. Hahu tabcha de ishtakach de nafka treifta mitoch yidei. There was a butcher who was intentionally and knowingly passing off treif as kosher meat in his kosher store. Okay? Aye. Why does a person do this? The margins are better. Right, right. Yeah, go see what Purdue costs. Go see what Empire costs. If you can take Purdue and take it out of the package and put it in a bin and call it kosher, you can charge two and a half times as much a pound. And it's, it's greed. So the motivator here is greed. Okay? Possibly Rav Nachman ve'avre. Rav Nachman disqualified him from testimony, mo, testimony and removed him, took away his hashgacha to function as a butcher. So he loses his livelihood. Azal Rabbi Maze the Tufre. So the butcher went and he grew his hair and he grew his fingernails. This kind of public sign of shame and mourning and like I'm not going to shave and I'm not going to clip my nails and I'm going to walk through the streets and confess my sins and right this is what he does for some period of time Sava Rav Nachman Shore Rav Nachman wants to give him a hefter back look at what the guy's going through poor guy right let him have a job Amar Le Rava but Rava said to Rav Nachman Dilma Iorome Kamarin you know, he really could be deceiving you. Could all be a show. Right? So the question, what does he have to do to come back, hasn't been answered. Can he do anything? So Nachman's got Rachmanus on him, and he wants to help him out, he wants to forgive him, but Rava, who's the Gadol Bador, he's the, the guy in charge of the, the yeshiva at this time, he's like the head rabbi of, of the rabbis, says to him, no, he could be deceiving us. So the Gemara says, Ella, my takante, what, what's his takana? What's his tikkun? How can he fix it? Right? And could the Rav Idi Bar Avin, maybe we should follow the principle of Rav Idi Bar Avin, who said, Damar Rav Idi Bar Avin, Hachashud al hatrefot, ein lo takana, ad she yelech lemakom she ein makirin oto, ve yachzir aveda badavar chashuv. So he has to go to another town where nobody knows him and nobody knows his story. And there, evidently, he functions as a butcher, a kosher butcher. But he can't come back here and be believed by anybody who knew him until such a time as he has discovered, found, an extremely valuable thing and returned it to its owner or has discovered in his store highly valued, expensive treif that he has to take a loss by getting rid of the treif. He has to admit the treif in his hand. So he's got, you know, $1,000 he paid for a bull, and it's going to be the meat that he's going to sell in the store for a week, and the shechting is wrong. Nobody knows, but he sees it, and this time he makes the right decision and he throws the animal out or sells it to the goyim or feeds the dogs or whatever he's going to do with it. And, it's, and so he has shown he has done complete shuva. So the, the motivator the first time was greed. He has to demonstrate his change by being offered a circumstance where he could benefit through greed, and he turns the greed down and makes it good. Then that's a takana, and according to Rav Edi, he would be able to come back and sign documents or even be a judge. Yeah? Are there any crimes that you can commit that you cannot be forgiven I'm thinking murder, murder. Tree, yeah. idol worship. Yeah, those are the three. You cannot murder, idol worship, murder, idol worship, and the sexual prohibitions. Yeah, right? I, I just, as an aside, I asked that question to Rabbi Harrison from the rabbinical college, and he said, there's no crime you can commit that you can't be forgiven for, including those three. God is capable of forgiving you. The problem is, in the case of murder, the person you did it to is not capable of forgiving you, necessarily. So it depends what your theology of the soul is. And is that soul able to forgive you after death? And in the very traditional world, it has become commonplace for people to ask the dead for their forgiveness. 
And you'll see this at funerals, mainstream Orthodox funerals, where the person will walk up to the casket, sometimes symbolically it's just the rabbi, and will say, Joe, I ask for your forgiveness for anything that I ever did to harm you. I ask that you forgive the people here for anything that they ever did to harm you. We forgive you for anything you ever did to harm right? There's a ritual of forgiveness that takes place at the casket in the funeral. Have you ever seen this? No, I've never seen this. I, I, I never knew about I've seen this. I saw Rabbi Zwickler in town do this, right? And it's become a more common practice in mainstream orthodoxy. It comes from a certain theology of the soul that the soul is still personalized and able to engage in some form of change activity towards teshuva, towards forgiveness, towards these kinds of very divine acts. Is there anything God cannot forgive us for? God can forgive us for anything. So once you've justified that the human soul can forgive and God can forgive, then anything can be forgiven. I think in the older sense of it was sins that are bein adam lechavero, between us, God cannot forgive what I do to you. Only you can forgive what I do to you. And if what I did to you is irreparable, like I raped a virgin, God forbid, there's no amount of forgiveness that she can give me that restores her to her status. I kill a man, there's no amount of forgiveness I could receive that restores him to his previous status. So there, is, there seems to be things that are, that are irreparable. Are they unforgivable if they're irreparable? Idolatry is just death penalty. You can't say I'm sorry and evade the death penalty. Can you be forgiven and executed? <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that's between man, yeah. So I think in the case of death penalty for idolatry, humans are commanded to execute the person the person is given an opportunity to seek teshuva and forgiveness from God. God will forgive them, and they die without the sin. But they're still executed. If you believe in a world to come that is based on the status you're in when you die, that's an important point. Right? I would assume idolaters would just get out of there, get out of town. <laughs> yeah, well, people are going to run if they can run. These are for the people who got caught. <laughs> right? Okay. So, so I, yeah. I have a question about Kashur. This might seem bizarre, but since I never had it, I never thought about it before. Yeah. And when you're talking about giving the trafe, Feeding the trafe to the dog. Yeah. Is that, if you are yeah. kosher, there's nothing wrong with giving unkosher meat to your animals? The only forbidden food that you're not allowed to feed your animals is chametz bepesach. Okay. Right? You, but you're absolutely allowed to feed trafe to your dog. It's a very good use of trafe. Okay. If you're going to go, if you're going to go to Shoprite, uh -huh. and you're going to push your aisle down the kosher aisle, filling with food for you, and then you turn left and go a little ways and start filling your cart with non-kosher meat, you may confuse the neighbors. <laughs> right? Never watching the cart. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm the rabbi. Everyone's looking in my cart. <laughs> it's true. You go to Aaron's, so <laughs> right, right. So you go to Aaron's, you don't have this option. But then you're paying for kosher food for your dog, and why would you do that? Because it's expensive. Um, obviously, if you were to bring that trafe into your home, you have to handle it very carefully. It has to be kept separate from everything else. It can be wrapped up and kept in your refrigerator, but its dishes and bowls and everything should not be washed in your sink or your dishwasher. It should be washed out on the back porch with dedicated sponges. And, you know, there's ways to do it. But your dog doesn't need to keep kosher. Good, I'm glad to hear that. You can buy whatever the cans of packed trafe are that they feed the dogs. Don't use your sink for your animal's food unless your animal's food has a hexer on it. Because you're trafing your sink. Can you get kosher dog? I'm sure you can. Anything for money. All right. Okay. We are at 12.59. Let me see where we are. Okay. So that's the, the butcher, and we finished, and the next one is going to be Mafrika Yonim, oh, which, is, which is the no maker. baker, no <laughs> candlestick maker. So next week when we meet, we're going to be on Mafrika Yonim, and we're going to go into the pigeon flyers. Why are the pigeon flyers not kosher? Okay? Uh, so welcome back. Thank you. In review, that sugia was a little clearer than the first time we did it. Yes. Yes.